Welcome to Primary today. We're going to start off with an opening song. Our opening song will be I Want to Give the Lord My Tenth from the Love to Teach YouTube channel. This week we are going over 3rd Nephi chapters 20 through 26, and we're going to get a recap here from the Book of Mormon Videos Scripture Project YouTube channel. Okay, strap in and buckle up, because we're going boldly into prophecies that Jesus taught the future descendants of the Lamanites and future Gentiles. Now keep in mind here, with symbols and prophecies, there can be multiple layers with many possible interpretations. And these here are truly fascinating and important to our world today. Jesus begins chapter 20, letting the people know it's okay to stop praying out loud. But he adds, never stop praying in your heart. Now, as many of us have always on smartphones with perhaps that weird anxious feeling of constant connection and FOMO, the Lord really desires us to have a sort of peaceful, prayer-like, always on spiritual connection to Him so we can always be ready for His Holy Ghost promptings to do good. And what's one of the best ways to keep this connection strong? Well, Jesus shows them again by administering the sacrament miraculously and spiritually fills them, helping them renew their brand new covenant with this deep, special spiritual connection. And now Jesus teaches one of the most interesting sermons of the whole Book of Mormon. You see, a special promise or covenant had been given to this people since the days of their founding fathers, Lehi and First Nephi, and was renewed again with Enos as they deeply cared for their people's future. And what is the special covenant? That after the eventual destruction of the Nephite nation by the Lamanites, in the latter days, God would reclaim their children, their descendants, or as he says, a remnant of their seed, with these scriptures written for them, and give them the fullness of his gospel once again. But if the future Gentiles, the migrating nations to America, as well as all those who don't accept the gospel, don't repent after being so super blessed and after they scatter and scourge these descendants then these descendants will be like a young lion among the gentiles treading and tearing god's sword of justice will be ready for all the gentile nations as he will fulfill his covenant and establish his people in the land of the new jerusalem by his heavenly power and now jesus states yes I am that prophet who all other prophets have prophesied of, and those who don't listen to my gospel will be cut off. But by my awesome Abrahamic covenant, the whole earth will be blessed, especially the Gentiles. And here he closes, quoting Isaiah, that his gospel covenant people will sing and see his holy arm and break the bands from their necks and be exalted on high. And his promises, his covenants, will be fulfilled. Okay, so why are God's promises or covenants so important? Well, many of us receive patriarchal blessings with special individual promises, and the scriptures are also full of them. When we learn to trust in God's promises, we activate our faith. And in the scriptures we learn God always fulfills his promises at some point but he usually requires great patience on our part 
And as we see our special promises and blessings fulfilled, our faith truly becomes stronger. And then we can reinvest this trust over and over, even until that great promise is fulfilled, that through Christ, we will one day return to him and be like him. And now in chapter 21, he gives them and us a sign so we know when these things are happening. And what is the special sign? It is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the fullness of the gospel preached to these descendants like it is today. Yes, the Father established a free people here so these words could go forth to their descendants. And if the Gentiles don't harden their hearts, they too are part of his special covenant to then help reclaim all of his covenant people, including the lost ten tribes. But again, the curse. His fifth time mentioning it here, that if the Gentiles do not repent, he will destroy their chariots, their cities, strongholds, witchcrafts, graven images, and their wickedness will be eliminated with vengeance and fury never before seen. But if the Gentiles do repent, they will have power from heaven. Did he make his point clear? And now in chapter 22, Jesus quotes Isaiah 54, that even with all the bad stuff happening in the latter days, that his people need not fear, but that he will gather them in and protect them and show them great mercy and kindness. And he closes this sermon in chapter 23 with, read Isaiah. He wrote really great stuff and it will all be fulfilled. So now, finally, Jesus wants to give them some scripture that they don't have yet from Malachi and then asked to look over Nephi the third's record. Thumbing through, he notices and asks, Nephi, I'm not seeing Samuel the Lamanite's prophecies in here. Why aren't they here? And Nephi responds, oh yeah, yeah, now I remember. They didn't get written down. Okay, Jesus responds in love. Yes, let's get them in. And Nephi does. And so as we conclude, Mormon tells us that they had a three-day scripture feast with lots more not written down, but that even the little children were speaking prophecies that shouldn't be written. And finally, once again, he healed all of their sick who weren't there before, raised a man from the dead, and organized them to have all things in common. But there was still one important question that remained. What should we name this his new church? Well... We'll address that in the next video. Paying tithing opens the windows of heaven. Jesus says that if we pay our tithing, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that there shall not even be enough room to receive them. This is a story about tithing. Abigail was at the store with her mother. When she was at the store, Abigail saw lots of things. She saw oranges. She saw tomatoes. She saw carrots. She saw bread. And she saw a toy kitty.
my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to wash the windows, her mother said. Abigail didn't like washing the windows, but she really loved the kitty. So she washed all the windows. Now she had two dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to sweep the floors, the mother said. Abigail didn't like sweeping the floors, but she really loved the kitty. So she swept all the floors. Now she had three dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to wash the dishes, her mother said. Abigail didn't like washing the dishes, but she really loved the kitty. So she washed all the dishes. Now she had four dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to make your bed, mother said. Abigail didn't like making her bed, but she really loved the kitty, so she made her bed. Now she had five dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to dust the furniture, mother said. Abigail didn't like dusting the furniture, but she really loved the kitty, so she dusted all the furniture. Now she had six dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to put away the toys, Mother said. Abigail didn't like putting away the toys, but she really loved the kitty, so she put away all the toys. She had seven dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to take out the trash, Mother said. Abigail didn't like taking out the trash, but she really loved the kitty. So she took out all the trash. Now she had eight dollars. What's my next job, Abigail asked. Next, I need you to water the plants, Mother said. Abigail didn't like watering the plants, but she really loved the kitty, so she watered all the plants. Now she had nine dollars. What's my next job? Abigail asked. Next, I need you to set the table, Mother said. Abigail didn't like setting the table, but she really loved the kitty, so she set the table.
Father wants us to learn about our ancestors. As prophesied in these verses, Elijah has restored the sealing keys that let us be with our families for eternity. In 3 Nephi 25 verse 6 it says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. The children are us, everyone who's alive on the earth today. The fathers are talking about all those who lived before, like our ancestors. When we learn about our ancestors and do temple work for them, our hearts are turning to our fathers. Nitroglycerin, this highly explosive compound, befuddled modern scientists for years. Something so powerful must certainly have a use. If only this power could be harnessed. Through trial and error, and more error, scientists, well, you get the picture. It wasn't until Alfred Nobel discovered that combining nitroglycerin with a clay-like substance made it possible to control the powerful explosion. Dynamite, a force that can literally move mountains. By combining the right two elements, Alfred Nobel created a force that was more effective, more useful, and therefore more powerful. Many of us have felt close to the spirit and had special feelings of love while searching for our ancestors. Many of us have also felt peace and comfort while visiting the temple. But are we missing out on a greater spiritual power? What if we tried combining family history with another spiritual experience, like visiting the temple? There is a spiritual pull in all of us to connect with our ancestors. When we combine our family history work with temple blessings for them, will enjoy a power that can move mountains in their lives and in ours. The real power comes when we combine family history with the blessings of the temple. You'll find not only protection from the temptation and ills of this world, but you'll also find personal power, power to change, power to repent, power to learn, power to be sanctified, and power to turn the hearts of your family together and heal that which needs healing. Family history party. I'm bored, let's do something. I'm already doing something. I'm looking at family photos, but I wanna have a party. How about doing both? We could have a family history party. Sounds boring. Let's go, it'll be fun. Should we make some popcorn? Welcome to the family history party. Our first game is family tree trivia. Where was Grandma Jensen born? Ireland, Canada, Poland, pretty picture. Now it's time for the great index race. The team that has indexes the most names wins. Look, that person has the same name as me. Now we've saved the best for last. Family history story time. When my dad was little, his family lived on a ranch. Later that night, that was the best party ever. Let's do it again tomorrow. This is a Type 14 Nambu semi-automatic pistol. It has wooden handle scales, a safety lock, and fixed sights. It comes in a nifty leather case complete with an extra magazine, some cleaning papers, and this rod that is used to force the papers into the barrel. I think it was most likely used by a Japanese officer during World War II. And before I got it, it belonged to my grandfather. 
Joseph James Moser was born in Haig, North Dakota, June 1st, 1912. Haig is a small town, small, like less than 70 people small, with terribly cold winters. You know how your parents used to say they walked three miles in the snow to get to school? Yeah, my grandpa actually did that when he was six. He never finished school, as he puts it, because of music. When he was 12, he traveled with a six-piece band. Joe was an amazingly gifted piano player. He never had lessons, he couldn't read music, but he could play. He was a prodigy. Joe even played with the military band when he first enlisted in the United States Army. He was assigned to Echo Company, 383rd Infantry, 96th Division, nicknamed the Dead Eyes. On April 1st, 1945, they landed in Okinawa, Japan, where he fought in the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War, what was known as the Typhoon of Steel. Over 200,000 soldiers and civilians died in that battle, a battle that lasted 82 days. My grandfather never talked about any of this. He mentioned his training in the United States and going to Leyte in the Philippines, but all he ever told my mom was how hard war was and how many friends he lost. In his journal, he only wrote a couple of sentences about the war. He said, After the Leyte campaign, we went to Okinawa and made the initial landing there. After the fighting ended, I boarded the ship on the 14th of August for the United States. That space between sentences is huge. A giant hole. A mystery. What happened over there? What did he experience? Any information regarding the campaign and what happened, I had to research and find out for myself. Digging through different accounts I found here and there. The more I read, the more I was caught up, overwhelmed with emotion for what my grandfather must have seen and experienced. I had no idea. The thing is, I knew my grandpa as a funny, kind piano playing man who always had a toothpick in his mouth and a dozen more in his shirt pocket. of his life for over 50 years. He loved God and he loved his country. He loved learning and was often seen with an encyclopedia in his hands. He could fix anything and had an extensive array of tools and gadgets in his garage. Once, he was the technical military advisor for the 1955 Korean War film, Target Zero. He took his wife dancing frequently even after he retired from the army in 1976. In 1978, he moved back to North Dakota to a town named Strasburg. He often played piano for the residents of a nursing home. And after noticing the Strasburg Cemetery was poorly organized, he spent years volunteering to match names to graves, creating a map of the cemetery. Grandpa passed away in 1997. After my grandmother died in 2008, I traveled to Strasbourg with my mom to help with the funeral and other arrangements. While in their home, I found this adorable picture of my grandparents. I asked my mom about the gun my grandfather was holding. She had no clue. She didn't know he ever owned a gun. But then she told me that if I found it, she was sure my grandfather would want me to have it. I spent the next two days looking, but couldn't find anything. The day before we had to leave, I went upstairs to a room where I'd found other military-related things. I had looked in that room several times, figuring it was the most logical place the pistol would be. I actually said out loud, Grandpa, we're leaving tomorrow. If you want me to have this gun, I need you to help me find it. As I stood there, I had the thought to check a closet full of uniforms I know I had checked several times already. I was compelled to look one more time. On the back of the closet was a row of hooks. And on one of those hooks, a leather strap, which was connected to a leather case. Excited, I quickly grabbed the case and opened it. I still don't know the story behind how my grandfather came to possess this gun or why he kept it for almost 60 years. I may never know. And it really doesn't matter. I found a connection. 
connection to him through it and the experience of finding it. I've gained a stronger relationship with him as I learned more about his life, what he experienced and what was important to him. He was always so sweet to me. He made me laugh, made me feel good about myself. He gave me his name and his sense of humor. I am grateful to know him better for the chance to strengthen our relationship even after he had passed on. search the scriptures diligently. The Savior told the multitude to search the scriptures, and he wanted to make sure they recorded the words of the prophets. What does it mean to search the words of the prophets? How is searching different from just reading? Heavenly Father gives us lots of things because he loves us very much. One very special present from Heavenly Father is the Holy Scriptures. It's like a letter from Heavenly Father. In the Scriptures, we can find things that Heavenly Father wants to tell us. Prophets have been writing Heavenly Father's words for thousands of years. The Old Testament was written by prophets like Moses and Isaiah. The New Testament was written by prophets like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Book of Mormon was written by prophets like Nephi, Alma, and Moroni. And the prophet Joseph Smith wrote the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. That's a lot of scriptures. Sometimes you might even feel like there's too many scriptures and they're too hard to read. But all you have to do is read a little at a time. The scriptures can be lots of fun too. You can pretend like you're a detective looking for clues to solve a mystery. Or you can pretend you're following instructions on a treasure map that leads to hidden treasure. You can also pretend you're playing hide and seek. If you look around, you'll find lots of surprises in the scriptures. start by looking for Jesus Christ in the scriptures. The prophets talk about him on almost every page. Just find his name, then see what it says about him. If you know how to read some other words, like the word repent, you can look for a match. There it is. There it is again. When you see something written over and over again in the scriptures, that's a clue. It's probably important. Another way to learn from the scriptures is to ask, how is this scripture like me? God commanded the prophet Nephi to build a boat. Nephi obeyed, and he worked really hard to build it. So, how is this scripture like you? Have you ever built anything before? Or have you ever worked hard like Nephi? If you look, you'll find lots of ways that the scriptures are like you. Another good way to learn from the scriptures is to study them together with other people, like your family and your friends. When we read the scriptures, we should always listen for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost helps us know when something is true. When we learn something from the Holy Ghost, we should write it down. And then we can remember to do it. You can also share the things that you learn with other people. Can you imagine if you got a present on your birthday and you didn't even open it? Well, if we don't read our scriptures, that's like not opening a present from Heavenly Father. What will you choose to do? Will you leave the present wrapped? 
or will you open the present and read the things Heavenly Father wants to tell you? If you want to see more videos, we can pray in our hearts. Normally, normally when we pray, we kneel down, fold our arms, bow our heads, and close our eyes to block out all the distractions from the world and to focus on Heavenly Father. But sometimes we need to talk to Heavenly Father when we can't kneel down or close our eyes or do any of those things. What can we do in those situations? In 3 Nephi 20 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that he, meaning Jesus, commanded the multitude that they should cease to pray, and also his disciples. And he commanded them that they should not cease to pray in their hearts. Jesus commanded them that they should not stop praying in their hearts. What are some examples of times that you can think of when a prayer in your heart would be better than out loud or kneeling down with your eyes closed? How can I pray as the Savior taught? Pray for others. Pray and watch always. Pray in your families. Keep your prayers simple, direct, and sincere. And pray often in your heart and in your mind. Pray fervently. With God, all things are possible. He who notes the fall of a sparrow surely hears the pleadings of our hearts. Sister Daisy Ogando lives in New York City, home to more than 8 million people. Some years ago, Sister Ogando met with the missionaries and was taught the gospel. Gradually, she and the missionaries lost contact. Time passed. Then in 2007, the principles of the gospel she'd been taught by the missionaries stirred within her heart. One day while getting into a taxi, I was getting into a taxi when suddenly I saw in the corner some missionaries talking to the people. I turned around in my seat in the taxi, watching until they were out of sight. I began to pray in my heart to God. I closed my eyes and told God in my heart that if he would send the missionaries again to my home, I was not going to let them go again. When I got to my apartment building, and as I was walking up to the third floor, there were two missionaries who were talking with a lady. And I smiled because I feel it was like an answer that came almost too quickly. When they knocked on the door, I went running to open the door. And I said to them, come in, I've been waiting for you. Praying has helped me to serve more because praying and being in communication with God has helped me be more loving with people. It has helped me to be more humble. It has helped me to be more devoted to the church and to God. Praying has helped me a lot to always watch out for other people. I know he had a plan laid out for me even before the missionaries came to my house for the first time. He had a plan for me that I had to be in the place where I am now, where he wanted me to be. He rescued me in the moment just when I needed him. And this is my testimony about prayer. I asked him with love to rescue me, and he rescued me. Two fervent prayers were answered. Missionary lessons were taught. 
and arrangements were made for Daisy to be baptized. Remember to pray fervently. To those within the sound of my voice who are struggling with challenges and difficulties, large and small, prayer is the provider of spiritual strength. It is the passport to peace. Prayer is the means by which we approach our Father in heaven who loves us. Speak to him in prayer and then listen for the answer. Miracles are wrought through prayer. closing song will be If I Listen With My Heart from the Elsie Bird 68 YouTube channel. concludes this week's lesson. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.